Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, my name is Mitchell Warren, the executive director of AVAC, and I so wish that I were with all of you in person uh, to meet and talk and debate and plan for the future together. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not, uh, and I'm not even able to join remotely uh, in real time. Uh, so you're getting a recording. Um, but I'm so grateful to CNS and my dear friends there to organize this meeting and to bring everyone together to talk about the future of HIV and TB. I'm gonna focus mostly on HIV, but so much of what we know and do and think about HIV is informed by TB. Uh, it was once said that history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes a lot. And I think many of the issues I hope to discuss in the next few minutes relate as much to HIV prevention and treatment and ending that epidemic as they do to TB and ending that epidemic. We have targets in this world for TB, uh, for HIV, for malaria, for pandemics, and very often, most often, if not always, those ambitious UN targets don't get met. Uh, they hopefully drive policies and programs and investments, but they rarely actually achieve the success that we seek. Here were targets that were established back in 2014, 10 years ago, for where the world needed to be by 2020, uh, to be fewer than 500,000 new infections per year. And we missed that target terribly. And you can see above some of the ambitious uh, desires within the model to tell us we could end the epidemic and what was actually implemented. And the gap is huge and it gets larger over the last five years, um, generally and particularly because of the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID pandemic. And yet, UNAIDS rightly put out more ambitious targets in 2020 for where we needed to be in 2025. The good news is these new targets do recognize uh, a much greater centrality around policies and behavior change and the individual at the center of the epidemic, as you can see in this graphic about people living with HIV and communities at risk at the center, that was not the case in 2020. But we still have a long way to go to come even close to what are now these 95, 95, 95 targets. But importantly, the recognition that it's the numbers we leave behind, the fives and the tens, that are our biggest problem. This is a slide, and Bobby knows it well, um, that I've been working with for 20 years, where in HIV, we seek to develop a method mix in HIV prevention, not unlike what's happened in contraception. And you can see that up until 2006, we had done very poorly. We had male and female condoms and behavior change, but not much else. Um, unlike contraception, where you see a very robust set of, of uh, methods in the mix. The good news, 15 years later, we now have a much more robust method. And you can see a lot of activity in HIV. The tech marks are products in black that are actually approved, uh, oral prep, of course, um, voluntary medical male circumcision. We now know that U equals U, that undetectable in treatment is untransmittable. Uh, and other things in red that are in development, and I'm gonna talk a bit about some of these coming up. But I wanna make one really important point here. We may now look as robust in HIV as we do in contraception, but when we developed this graphic originally in 2006, the idea was to do even better than contraception. Because although contraceptive research and development has brought dozens of methods over many years of, of investments, many people walking into a clinic are only given one or two of those options. Um, they don't actually get that full method mix. So our task in HIV is not only to develop all of these additional options, but to deliver them at scale, with speed, and most of all, with equity to actually have impact in the epidemic. This gives you a quick snapshot of what's emerged as we now have this range of methods available. The vaginal ring and injectable cabotegravir now moving into to implementation studies and programs. And of course, next generation products, and I'm gonna spend a little time talking about those. But I wanna first do a quick language check because we talk all the time about biomedical options. And I wanna make the point that options are, are critically important. They're the fruits of science. That's what R&D, the research and development process does, developing additional biomedical options. But translating those into choices for people is what our job is as public health practitioners, not just to develop, but to deliver. And we need to make sure that those products reach people as viable choices. And that's when things get messy. It's about policymakers and donors and governments and implementers to make that mix available, accessible, and affordable. 
that is the challenge ahead of us. As we get more and more of these methods in the mix, we have more options, but are they actual choices? And why does that matter? Well, we know in contraception that choice matters because when we actually increased contraceptive availability in the clinics, in the community-based programs, not just the R&D pipeline, you can see that contraceptive prevalence actually went up. But what about HIV? Well, the important news is that we have voices for choice. These are graphics from two partners that we work with, a women's group in, in Southern and East Africa who have focused on the Choice Manifesto and a global key population group who have made these demands because this, the voices for choice are real, wanting to translate what we see in contraception into what we can see in HIV. And we now have data to back it up. Uh, many of you may know from the retrovirus meeting, so-called CROI that happened in March. There's a study that's been going on for a number of years in rural Kenya and Uganda that looked at, at a study called SEARCH that first looked at, at expanding testing and treating and then introduced PrEP, and PrEP was seen as lowering the incidence uh, in, in, in the communities that had access to PrEP in addition to treatment. And this was data from three years ago. But what's most exciting is what came out at CROI this year, three years later. After expanding treatment in PrEP, they then began an additional study to randomize people to a dynamic choice arm. And in blue, you can see the uptake of any prevention product, any coverage, in the arm of the study that was given a choice between oral PrEP, injectable PrEP, and oral PEP, compared to an orange, the group that was just the standard of care, which was basically PrEP in the clinic. And what you can clearly see is that more people chose something um, in blue than in orange on that top left. On the top right, you can see that when people were given the choice, there were no infections in the dynamic choice arm. And an incidence rate of about 2% in the standard of care arm, clearly choice mattered. But perhaps the most important thing from that study was what's in the bottom slide. And that is that not everybody chose cabotegravir. While injectable PrEP was chosen by well over half people, many more people also began to choose oral PrEP and they add up to more than hundred because people could switch between methods. That compares to only 20% of people who used PrEP in the standard of care. Clearly choice matters. So how can we make that real? Well, one way to make that real is to recognize that no biomedical option is only biomedical, whether for prevention or for treatment, whether for HIV or for TB. These products exist in behavioral and structural context. And if we don't address the behavioral and structural context, then the best biomedical product goes unused. We have all lived through four years of the COVID pandemic. We know what happens when great products get developed, vaccines, COVID therapeutics, if they don't get used, they don't have impact. And, and one of the polio vaccine developers many years ago now said, a safe and efficacious vaccine that sits on the shelf is neither safe nor efficacious. So biomedical products that sit on the shelf don't actually have impact if we don't deal with the behavioral and structural issues. So while my talk is very much around the, behavior, uh, around the biomedical, I don't want anybody to think that any of these methods, whether HIV prep, TB drugs, which is actually getting far easier now, um, thanks to advances, a future TB vaccine, none of that can happen if we don't address behavioral and structural issues. And one other piece to highlight, of course, is that we live in a parallel universe very often between the providers and health systems and users. The idea is that you know health systems and providers wanna know who's at risk or who's infected and how do we get them treatment or prevention. And it's all about finding those people. But that's not how individuals operate. Individuals, particularly in HIV, but I would argue in TB as well, are thinking about what do I want? And very often that's about their relationships, their safety, well-being, their pleasure, their sexuality. And it's only later that they begin to navigate in, hopefully, to thinking about HIV prevention. Our job is not to help individuals fall into our system but rather we need our systems to adjust to the people. And importantly, you'll see there are two elements of choice, choice both in product, but also choice in terms of where I want it and from whom I want it. So choice matters on multiple levels. And I will just say that while we developed the biomedical products around the pathogen, around the HIV virus, or around the spike protein in COVID, or around tuberculosis as a pathogen, we need to design the programs around the people.
That's what matters. And that's how you get to impact. We actually did a, a study in South Africa over a number of years um, looking at user-centered design with young adolescent girls and young women to understand their thinking uh, about sexuality, about HIV prevention. And perhaps not surprisingly, they're not thinking about their risk or about adopting safer sex behaviors. They're not thinking about HIV. They're not thinking that I'm a demographically a young woman in South Africa. They're thinking about what's relevant to me. What habits fit into my life? What relationships do I want? What are my needs? What is the ecosystem in which this works? And what are the options that I want? And that's how we need to design programs going forward. Of course, over the last 12 years, we've begun to learn a lot about HIV prevention because of PrEP. And you can see here very limited uptake of PrEP. And I'm sad that India, which still could benefit so much from PrEP, is, is in one of the uh, colors that show very low uptake of PrEP. Um, but it's growing, and you can see that just in the last three years, it's beginning to grow. But only 7 million people in the world have ever even initiated PrEP at some point. That doesn't mean they've continued to be PrEP users. And it's important to note that the global target for PrEP is about numbers of users uh, of safe and effective products, not how many people initiated it once and maybe didn't continue. So we have a lot of work to do. And while we do need to scale up oral PrEP, we need to also think about this pipeline of products. This is the timeline that shows products, the vaginal ring and injectable cabotegravir in the first half of this. And you can see a lot of activity to move these products into programs. But just two weeks ago, you will know that Gilead Sciences, the company um, that makes a number of antiretrovirals, um, has been studying lenacapavir, this other injectable, this one every six months, as opposed to cabotegravir every two months. And the purpose one trial of um, cisgender women in, in you know, East and Southern Africa showed a remarkable result that the group that got lenacapavir had no infections in the trial. Now, we don't yet know the purpose two results. They'll come later this year, and it will still be a year or more for the data to be analyzed, to be reviewed in peer review, to go through regulatory guidance. But it tells us that we may soon have another very potent product. At the same time, I want to call people's attention to this lighter purple of, of a product called MK8527. This is a monthly oral tablet that Merck is developing. It's in a phase two trial and it could next year go into a phase three study. And, and then I'm very excited by a product that we work on called the dual prevention pill. This is the combination of oral prep with combined oral contraception that we know many women want a product that meets both of their sexual and reproductive health needs, HIV prevention and contraception. We certainly have it in male and female condoms. We may soon get it in the dual prevention pill. This could come into the market sometime next year. So this is a very dynamic and exciting place. But we have typically moved far too slowly in moving science into impact. And you can see at the top oral prep where we got the evidence in 2010. And more than 10 years later, we really only began to see the scale of the program. You can see with the Depivirine ring, we knew in 2016 that it was safe and effective. And you can see how long it's taken us, not much better than oral prep, years post-efficacy to move into recommendations, and to product introduction. The world has moved faster with cabotegravir. In the midst of COVID, we got results of cabotegravir. And you can see that approvals happened more quickly, both the first approval as well as African approvals. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that generics right now, there are three companies in India that now have licenses for generic cabotegravir. They will only get to the market around 2027. So we still have a few years to wait, but you can see that it is happening faster than it did with other products, but it's not fast enough. It is not fast enough to keep pace with an epidemic that does continue on despite global targets, despite our desire to be done with HIV and AIDS. And again, I would say the same thing about TB. We had one of the newest regimens with, uh, with TB with the advance of Pertominate a few years ago, um, but it still moved too slowly into the real world. How can we go faster? This just zooms in a bit on lenacapavir, the product that just two weeks ago, we got that nice green star of super high efficacy. But how can we make these other icons go faster? Uh, and that's the work that a number of us are involved with, with, with funders, with civil society, demanding and driving change. 
I said earlier that no biomedical product exists on its own. It's all about uh, the behavioral and structural issues. And I want to just make the point here that um, no one product is going to solve for all of the challenges. And we need to think about these products across a number of considerations. You know, yes, we saw in the, in the Lena Kapavir study just two weeks ago, very high efficacy and great dosing and duration. But how are we going to deliver an every six-month injection? Do people want it? Is it discreet enough? What are the side effects? Do I have to train providers? How do I create demand? No one data point is the answer. And while I certainly am very excited about the Lena Kapavir result, clinical trial results don't end epidemics and prevent infections. It's when we address all of these in combination that we do that. And no one product can do it. It's about building programs that can deliver condoms still because we need them. And remember, they provide triple protection, HIV protection, contraception, and STI protection. Um, we need different products. We ultimately need a vaccine. Every product needs to fit in and be considered across this range of issues. And we certainly, most of all, don't know the cost yet of lenacapavir. So a lot of unknowns and a lot of things we need to consider in the months and years ahead. And as we do that, again, this is related to both TB and HIV. It's not just uh, the user at the center, although that's most important, but it's often about those who choose, those who use, and those who pay the dues. And very often the people who use don't get to choose. The program or the health provider, the physician, the Ministry of Health, they decided. And very often, particularly in countries that rely on donor assistance, they can only do this work if funders invest. And if the funders don't want to invest in lenacapavir or the depivirine vaginal ring, then we don't actually get a user those options. So it's those who use, those who choose, and those who pay the dues. And we have to know that we have to balance across all of these issues. So what do we have to do? And again, across TB, across HIV, we have to continue to fill the product introduction gap, accelerating time to impact, creating demand for products, and differentiating how we deliver products for both treatment and prevention. But even with the advances of Protominid and, and the BPAL regimen, even though the first in years, the first phase three study of a TB vaccine in the M72 vaccine trial is taking place right now, even though we have some glimmers of hope, our product development gaps remain. We still need additional methods for TB prevention, for TB treatment, for HIV treatment, for HIV prevention. And we've got to work simultaneously to fill the gaps in both areas. If we do one and not the other, we're not going to create the sustainable, durable end to either TB or HIV. That's what combination treatment and prevention has to look like. There are a lot of resources here. I'm gonna share the slides with CNS. I wanna thank you all for taking time to be part of these conversations because we know that it, it takes a global community to move this work forward. Advocates, researchers, policymakers, funders, uh, and we really wanna work with all of you to make that happen. I have a lot of acknowledgements, a lot of thanks to a great set of colleagues and donors to make this work possible. And I look forward to seeing some of you in Munich at AIDS 2024 and to work with some of you in other settings uh, uh, outside of Munich. But thank you all so very much and have a great meeting.